wonderful um, webinar today, Martin. Absolutely. I mean, that's grounded. Taco. I tell Poland, a small country in the middle of Europe uh, can reach so far. That's 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 absolutely fantastic. And like it also shows how small the world is. You in the USA, me in <laughs> Europe, and and together with us, people from all over the, all over the world. That's <clears throat> yeah, that's wonderful. Welcome, everybody. From Nepal, hello. Well, this is great because this means teachers from all over the world can share their thoughts and ideas on uh, rubrics and peer review. And I just heard from the Tina that she's trying to get in. So hopefully we'll see her in a minute. Cool. Um, okay, let me tell you something uh, briefly about uh, Willow Barnowski. Um, Willow has been a fellow, I mean, was a fellow physically uh, in, in Poland at Rzeszów University. And now, uh, uh, yes. Could you please mute yourself? Please mute yourselves. <laughs> to, to talk to, to you guys. Okay. Hello, Lucena. Great to see you. Hello. Okay, let me. Uh, let's wait for Lucena with everything. Okay, Lucena. Great. Welcome, everybody. If you can type in the chat where you are today and just say hello so we know who's here today. Okay, Lucina, are you with us? Yes, I am. I am with you all the time. I am. Yes. <laughs> I've been trying to get in for a while. Oh, it worked no. finally. So here I am. I'm ready to uh, to enjoy the webinar as usual with Willow. So I'm optimistic and happy to be here. Good. I, I just uh, was about to um, introduce um, Willow, so maybe you could say a few things, say a few words about uh, about uh, Willow. Okay, let me let me just say very say it very briefly because there is so much information about Willow, uh, as far as our cooperation is concerned, uh, that there is a the whole pile of fascinating webinars. So just a few words about professional profile, and then I will just let the participants know uh, about some of the webinars which Willow has already uh, prepared for us and presented to us so that you can find them on our uh, YouTube channel. So to begin with, Willow is a very optimistic person. She's an educator and, and writer from San Jose, California. Uh, and she has been virtual English language fellow at, at the University of Opole and earlier, so in this academic year, and earlier she, uh, she uh, played the same role, but uh, that was uh, not virtual role at the University of Rzeszów. So she has been with us for a while and she has been inspiring us with her uh, areas of expertise, such as adult, adult education, university education, um, uh, and her intercultural knowledge as well, due to the fact that she has visited many countries and she has been teaching with me, uh, in many countries, uh, countries like, for example, Japan, South Korea, and last but not least, Poland. Yes, so she knows something about us Polish people as well. Maybe we could learn from her uh, uh, how it feels to be working with Polish people. Uh, I would like to enumerate some of Willow's webinars. One of the webinars was concentrating on, focus, uh, on critical thinking. 
um, and uh, the identifying uh, logical fallacies. Then there was another webinar about identifying the language bias. Then uh, Willow spoke about uncreative writing. So, uh, and she uh, referred to it as writing in the digital age. Uh, then uh, uh, she moved on towards critical thinking, one of the key uh, four C's, yes, key skills for uh, 21st century professional context. And she spoke about 10 activities for in incorporating critical thinking and media literacy into our teaching, into our class. Then there was uh, a webinar about teaching uh, adult learners and grade, uh, grading versus un ungrading. That was a very interesting uh, idea. And if you are interested in it, please check it for yourselves on, on our YouTube, YouTube channel. And today, using rubrics for, uh, and peer review in uh, academic writing classes. And uh, Willow has promised that it would be a, uh, that it will be a practical webinar, and uh, we will learn something about how to how to uh, uh, simplify our our process of teaching uh, and the process of learning for our students. So optimistically, over to you, Willow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lucina. It's wonderful to be giving another webinar with IHF Poland. Um, and as I've asked everyone who's here, if you have a chance just to type in the chat where you are, where you're from. And I see that we have a really international crowd today, a lot of Polish instructors and people from all over the world. So welcome, everybody. As Lucina said, we'll be talking about using rubrics and peer review um, in academic writing instruction. And as she mentioned, my name is Willow Barnowski, uh, and I'm a virtual English language fellow. Right now I'm teaching virtually at the University of Opole. I'm teaching graduate students in the English philology department. And I am currently in San Jose, California. So I've included a few photos of some of the uh, uh, flora in my neighborhood here because it's, the weather is quite warm now in California. Uh, and I also wanted to say that I do a lot of work with the uh, consulate in Krakow, the embassy in Warsaw, and also the regional English language office in Estonia. And of course, I get to work with wonderful organizations like IATFL Poland. So today we're going to be talking about uh, the rationale for using rubrics in peer review. I'll give you some examples of rubrics in peer review form. So if you would like to uh, start using them or use different types. Uh, you, I'll give you some links that you can go to and look at the examples there. Uh, in some cases, there are templates you can use. We'll talk about engaging students in the grading process. Uh, and uh, I'll share some feedback that I've received from my students when we did rubrics and peer review, some of my Polish students. And we'll have time for questions and comments. Um, and of course, throughout the webinar, as always, please type in the chat if you have questions or comments. If I see your comment, I can respond. If not, I will respond later. But definitely, I don't want this just to be, um, you know, me lecturing. I want you to also be sharing your comments and adding questions. And of course, uh, with so many teachers from Poland and all around the world, uh, I hope that we can all share some great ideas that we have um, about using these, uh, these in class. Okay, so first I wanna ask you, if you can write in the chat, have you used rubrics or peer review with your students? And if so, which ages do you teach? Are you teaching university, secondary school? Uh, and have you used rubrics or peer review with your students? Just to let us know, I wanna see uh, what the experience is here. Okay, so someone's used peer review with university students, someone's teaching adults. Oh, I love teaching adults uh, and hasn't used them yet. Great. Okay, who else? Uh, yes, at university level. Great. University. I'll wait a few more seconds to see if anyone else responds. Okay, so yes, peer review with secondary school students, rubrics with uni secondary and uni, haven't yet uh, school level, some with university students. Okay, great. So it looks like some of you have used them, some of you haven't. So uh, for those of you who haven't, feel free to ask questions. And for those of you who have, I hope that you can share some of your knowledge or um, ideas about 
using them. Okay. Ah, Ruby Star, I don't know that. Interesting. Okay, wonderful. So to move on, um, some of the rationale for using rubrics, uh, I, I share that I have a slide with some of the sources later so you can uh, look up these articles, uh, are that we can promote student learning and we can help students become self-regulated writers. And these of course are really intertwined and connected. And when we talk about self-regulation, we talk about how students using rubrics can learn goal setting, planning, self-monitoring, self-assessment, self-instruction, and self-reinforcement. Um, and self-monitoring is so important with students because it allows them to become aware of this writing process. So, you know, we all know that um, some students might have this idea that writing is just this process, product focused um, assignment. You know, you just, you, you write, you, you sit down and you write something and then you hand it in, but we want them to be aware that writing is this process and that, you know, it incorporates planning, maybe outlining, maybe brainstorming, all these different ways that you prepare to write. Um, and by, by providing rubrics for students and helping them to self-regulate and learn about the process, we help them to dispel this notion that some people are just naturally talented writers and some people are just not. Uh, and that's something that students that really fear writing really think they have that sort of fixed mindset that, well, I'm just not a good writer. And part of this is because a lot of students have this idea that writing is just something that you sit down and quickly do and it comes out perfectly. Um, I'm sure we've all had students that have handed in an essay or a, a, some piece of writing. And when you've given them feedback um, and they're supposed to, you know, edit, revise, and, and return the essay to you, they will just write a completely new essay. They have this idea that it's writing is this sort of once and done thing. You, you write it once, it should be perfect. You should get a good grade or just forget it. You have to try something new. So we wanna teach students that's really this process um, and writing isn't so easy even for uh, really good writers. Uh, and other things that rubrics can do uh, is that they can help students with time management. So when students look at the rubric, they remember, oh, I need sources, or oh, I need to do these steps, or I need to hand this in. So they don't think it's something that they can do, just do like a few minutes before it's due or the night before. Um, it provides clear expectations for the assignment uh, versus having this expectation of mind reading, because we really want our students to be autonomous, we want them to be confident, we want them, especially in today's world with so much, you know, fake news and, and fake uh, stories in the media and online, we want them to be um, critical thinkers and independent. So we, if we expect our students to just sort of read our minds in terms of what they need to do for an assignment and what sort of grade they're going to get, that really takes away some of their agency we want them to be um, students that expect to get information and expect to be, um, you know, to be able to ask questions about what's expected of them. Uh, this helps to demystify writing, as I just mentioned, um, it shows students what these explicit, explicit steps are. And also regarding grading, it makes grading transparent. Um, it, it makes grading more consistent and fair. And also, um, depending on what kind of rubric you, you use, um, or if you make your own rubric, it can make grading a lot less time consuming um, because you have this, you know, you already have the uh, guidelines set in front of you when you're grading your students' work. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the rationale for peer review. Um, peer review can help scaffold a task um, it can help with time management, again, because students realize, students, instead of waiting until the last minute to write their paper and hand it in, they have to have an earlier draft that is used for peer review. And so that, that, that makes it so that it doesn't take quite as much time for them to write their final paper because they already have a draft to work from. It provides a soft deadline to reduce anxiety. So instead of telling students something is due a certain day, they have the chance to actually hand in an earlier draft. Um, it provides, um, you know, instructor feedback for the students, and it teaches students that writing is not just a solitary task. Uh, in another webinar, I talked about how students are terrified of writing sometimes because they think it's this solitary pro um, process. You sit alone, you stare at this blank page or at a uh, blinking cursor, but by using peer review, you make it more communal and more of a communal task. 
uh, they get encouragement from their peers um, and they have a chance to compare their work to other peers and it's low pressure. They get to see, oh, you know, I'm doing about the same as my peers or well, my other, my peers are writing a lot more than I am or maybe better quality writing. I, I really need to sp spend more time on this. Um, it also gives them a chance to review the rubric and the guidelines for the assignment again, have another chance before handing it in. And they're also able to get new ideas from their peers. So I see that someone has their hand up. So let me check the chat. Um, let me just look at a few of these comments. Uh, and whoever has their hand up, can you type your comment or question? Uh, let's see. And someone mentioned that writing is the hardest skill to be taught. Yes, that's, that's definitely true for some students. So I see that someone has their hand up. If you'd like to type your question or comment in the chat, you can do so and then I can respond to it. Okay, so moving on. Um, when we talk about um, using peer review with drafts, so in this case, we would have students um, do peer review not with their final essay, but with a draft that they've written. This shows students that good writers revise because they'll have to revise their essay after their peers have looked at it. Uh, this shows students that the first draft is only part of the process and that writing is usually a multi-draft process. So I mean, not everyone's a multi-draft writer. Some people edit and revise as they write and they you know, technically only write one complete draft, but many writers have to you know, write the first draft to revise, edit, and then write multiple drafts. And this, this is a way of teaching students what, you know, how long the process can be. And also to remind students that revision usually takes more time than drafting. So you get students away from that idea that they should just sit down and whatever they type should be their final paper. No, what they type should be that those first ideas, that first draft that they get to work with um, or that they can revise you know, each sentence or each paragraph as they're writing. So we're going to talk about some examples of rubrics now, and if I could just ask everyone to mute themselves because I can hear someone talking now. Um, if you could just mute yourself, thank you. So I'm going to go over some examples of rubrics. And this is an example of a rubric. Um, it's, it's an analytic rubric, and this is for a personal interview essay. Uh, and if you would like to see um, other writing rubric examples, I have the source below. Also, um, I will give you my email address at the end of the and presentation. And if you would like, I can send you the PDF with all of the clickable links so that you can just click on them and go to these websites. Okay, one second. Let me just remind everyone to please mute your mics. Okay, um, let's see. So for the anal an analytic rubric is a rubric in which each criterion is scored separately. So this is an excerpt from this personal interview essay rubric. So this is a different sort of writing, but um, this is, I thought this was a good example. It's very clear in terms of the criteria um, being broken up. So one criterion would be the content. So as you can see for the content, the student can get four, three, two, or one points for the content. Um, and the teacher, whoever created the rubric had to first create all of these different, um, you know, uh, descriptions of what a, a four point um, essay looks like regarding content or three points or two points or one point. So for example, for content, if you, the student wants all four points in that criterion, they have to include answers to all the questions. They have to have complete factual answers. They have to have a bibliography. Um, maybe if they get a, a three points, some of the answers are incomplete. Um, and if they, if they only have one point, they have trivial questions, et cetera. So you can see how um, this really spells out for the student what they need to do for that criterion. And then another criterion is organization. So for example, uh, for four points, the first paragraph needs to introduce the person. They have to have a conclusion that gives a wrap up. If they only get three points, maybe their introduction is too brief or incomplete, et cetera. Um, so you can see that this, this um, making this rubric initially might take a lot of time for the 
and structure because they have to consider all of the ways in which a student um, might not um, complete all the requirements um, and really have to put a very clear description so students know exactly what is expected of them. And a few more criteria for the, from this uh, same rubric, word choice. So for example, for four points, you need to use a variety of sophisticated words. Um, for one point, you're just repeating simple words or using big words incorrectly. Um, and then for conventions, for four points, you need to use correct capitalization, spelling, punctuation, grammar, et cetera. And then, um, you know, if you have some spelling errors, you would get less points, et cetera. So this really clearly um, spells out what each student has done. And if you use a rubric like this, it would be, um, of course, you always want the students to see the rubric before you're using it to grade them. So this is something that you could give students um, when you give them their writing assignment. And they, you know, you could require them to also hand in a self-assessment with their essay so that you can check to make sure they looked at the rubric. Um, but this really gives students very clear instructions in terms of what you expect from each um, criterion. Okay. And one second. And I could someone. Uh, could everyone please turn off your microphones? I can still hear someone. Um, and then going on to the next example of analytic rubric for academic writing. Um, this is another one. Um, this is similar. You have different criterion. And um, for example, the first one is task compliance or format. And as you can see on the left, these are the scores that the student would get for each of these criterion. So for example, the student could get up to 12 points if they fully address all aspects of writing, they have in-text citations and frames, stays on task, alignment, spacing, et cetera, uh, but they might only get a maximum of seven points. Uh, excuse me, could everybody please mute your microphones? Everybody know how to mute? If you go up on your screen, you should see a microphone. If you click it, you can mute yourself, okay? Um, so you might only get a total of 10.7 points if um, not everything's fully developed or there's some digressions. Um, so this is another example of a type of analytic rubric that you could use for academic writing. And I have the source here too, if you'd like to use this as a template. Um, I have the, um, and if you get the PDF, you can just click on this link. Um, and, and then another criterion would be topic development, for example. So if you give this to the student, uh, when they're given the assignment, they can look down and kind of compare where their paper is or to, or to look at this, just the top score to make sure that their paper has all of those things um, in order to get a higher grade. Personally, I would find this rubric sort of difficult to grade with because I'm not exactly sure what would make the difference between a 10.8 and a 12. Um, and so, you know, it depends on uh, what works for you in terms of grading. Another example of an analytic rubric for academic writing, uh, if you look at this on the left, it has a scoring level, 4, 3, 2, 1. And then just one of the criterion is uh, knowledge of convention. So for example, in addition to meeting the requirements for a three, so the student would have to do, you know, would have to have everything fulfilled from one, two, and three. And then also the writing is error free, for example. Um, what I really like about this uh, rubric is that I like the language that's used. So if a student gets just one point, it's not like unsatisfactory or failing, it's beginning. Um, if someone gets a two on this criterion, it's developing or they're competent or accomplished. So I think that's a, that language is really encouraging to students if we're using language like, you know, unsatisfactory or below average, that could be a little discouraging because really this, this, that's um, the issue of a student isn't writing up to like a three or four level is that they are probably a beginning writer either in that genre or maybe their language skills um, are the, at the beginner level. And I wanted to point out that this resource uh, at csu.edu has a fantastic PDF with tons of rubric examples how to score rubrics, checklists for all sorts of subjects, including multiple ones for writing and different uh, school subjects. So I highly recommend 
you check out that resource, it's, it's um, a real gold mine of rubric information and templates. Um, and another rubric, and this would be ca uh, called a holistic rubric. So um, in terms of how you score, you would actually give a student a score, for example, the six, and this, this score would include a description of all of the different criteria. So you wouldn't have six points for composition or, you know, and then six points for, uh, you know, mechanics, but they're all together in one description. So this might be faster to grade in the sense that you, you know, would read a student's paper and then decide if they have a six or a four or two. Um, but it actually, it might be a little difficult to give, you know, to be able to break down like the difference between a six and a five. Um, but um, again, it's your choice in terms of how you like to grade and, uh, and what sort of paper you've assigned to your students. But so you can see the difference between six, it says um, essay demonstrates excellent composition skills, thought provoking thesis, effective organization, et cetera, effective diction and sentence skills, mechanics. And then a one would be composition skills may be flawed in two or more areas, diction, syntax, mechanics are excessively flawed and fails to accomplish the goals of the assignment. Um, so quite a range there. And someone commented, yes, I, the organizer does have, have an option to mute everyone, but because I am, I think I am like a, a participant and not a presenter, that's a little harder to do. Um, and Manel said, I've designed a rubric some years ago. I'd be grateful if you could assess it being an expert. Oh, I'm not an expert in this. Um, when I give these webinars, I'm giving webinars on topics that interest me, that things that I've done in my own classes, things that I've researched. So I'm sharing a lot of information with you in terms of things I've researched. Doesn't mean I've tried all of these. I'm more of, I view uh, my presentations as more as like idea sharing and collaborative. So um, I think that though, if you would like to email me any rubric suggestions or ideas you have, that's, that would be fantastic. Um, okay, let's see. One. So let's talk about a few more examples of rubrics. I just want to make sure I'm okay for time. Okay, so this is another example of a rubric. If you can see um, what it says here, that this is a single point rubric. So for this example, um, if you look in the photo, the middle column that says what I'll be assessing your essay on, that would talk about what the student needs to do about like mechanics, spelling, you know, uh, thesis sentence, etc. And then on the left, the teacher could, has a space to write comments about, you know, oh, your thesis statement isn't uh, strong enough, or um, you, you have some spelling errors. And then on the right, the teacher can comment on things you did an outstanding job on. So this kind of rubric can provide space for feedback. Um, and the description in the middle, the what you'll be assessed on, just talks about proficient writing. So this sort of single point rubric doesn't doesn't give a description of what a beginning essay looks like versus what a you know fantastic essay looks like. This one just talks about a proficient essay and a description of that. Um, and also this is great for if, if you have students hand in a draft. So this you can give all this feedback so they can work on their draft. Um, you can use this for a final essay feedback, but um, there's I don't see a space on this rubric for a grade. So if you're going to provide a grade to the students, you would need to add scoring information because um, otherwise students will have no idea how they're being scored. So there's a little bit of controversy about uh, rubrics versus checklists because um, there is a description that rubrics have um, two things. Rubrics have a criteria for students work and descriptions of performance levels. So checklists or single point rubrics only have one of those components. So some people say a single point rubric, like the one I just showed you, isn't really a rubric, it's a checklist. Um, I say, you know, wh whatever works for you, whatever you wanna call it, um, but they're often called um, single point uh, rubrics though, and some call, sometimes people call them checklists. And um, I wanna show you another example of a single point rubric. This actually is one from my class. I use this with my students. This is for an argumentative essay, and this is just an excerpt. Um, and for the criteria, you can see on the left, it is kind of like a checklist. I just tell them what they needed to do, so what, what kind of topic they had to choose, 
they had to have two views and give their own conclusion. And then they could get zero points for that if they didn't do it, one point if they did part of it, two points if they completed it. And then I, there's room for me to give them comments. Um, you know, second one, you know, incorporates peer review. Um, and then down at the bottom, talking more about the introductory paragraph, the topic, et cetera. So I really broke it down into exactly what the students needed to do for this. Um, and they can get zero, one, or two. So if it were a checklist, technically, they would only have a check mark, you know, so it would only either be zero points or one point, for example. But I have a little room here in case a student did part of, um, if they completed part of that. Uh, criterion. So I wanted to ask you to put in the chat, what do you think are some of the pros and cons of some of the rubrics that I just showed you? Or for those of you who think that um, if you've used rubrics before, and maybe you've used holistic or analytic or single point, what are some thoughts you have on that? Do you have a preference? Do you prefer to use single point? Or do you prefer to use analytic or holistic? Why don't you share uh, something in the chat since some of you have experience using rubrics. So Jihan said that the analytic rubric is more objective. I definitely think the analytic rubric is, yeah, you're right, because in the, with the holistic rubric, it really depends on how well you know that holistic rubric. It can be a little harder to explain why you gave someone a certain score. Um, the cons can be that rubrics are time consuming, especially with overcrowded classes and pros really constructive in terms of feedback. Absolutely. And, you know, there's research that shows that, and I'm sure we all kind of know this just intuitively from our experiences, is that students tend to, um, if you give students feedback and a grade, they often tend to ignore the feedback and just look at the grade. Um, and that, but that feedback can really be much more helpful for students. And I'll talk a little bit later about some different ways we can we can use that. Um, but typically, you know, students tend to fixate on a grade and not look at the feedback. But we spend so much time giving students feedback and, and consider it to be really helpful. Um, Olivia is interested in using rubrics in ESP classes, and she's not sure if her students are ready. Uh, um, you might want to start off just using a very simple rubric, um, you know, maybe just, you know, maybe three criteria on the rubric. Um, for example, you know, um, the topic and the content is is comprehensible. Um, the, you know, the form they followed the formatting and the spelling and grammar is good, you know, something like that, just something really, really basic to start off with just to get students used to a rubric or to use that for the first draft. Um, but definitely you don't wanna just start off throwing a really complicated rubric at students, especially if you're working with younger students or students who don't have a really high level of the language. Um, let's see, some more encouraging collaborative work. Yeah, a best mode that's true, depends on the level of the students, especially for some people who teach adults and you might have a really wide range of abilities in your class. I didn't put this in the presentation, but I'll say that you have to consider that when you do um, um, if you're use if you're doing rubrics like collaboratively, if you're doing peer review, you need to make sure that either you put students in groups where some students are higher level, some are lower level, or you might choose to just put higher level writers together and then beginning writers together. So it definitely takes a lot of thought um, when you use that in class. Um, oh, this is wonderful! So many comments here. Let me see. Um, so you want to avoid bias among the learners. Um, it can be effective to use this blind review and feedback to avoid bias. Yeah, that's true. I mean, definitely, if you have time um, to have multiple instructors using the rubrics, that's how you're supposed to develop the rubrics, right? Is you have multiple instructors use the rubrics, look at different papers and see if they come up with the same grade using those rubrics. And that evaluates the effectiveness or the fairness of that, of that rubric. Um, let me see if there's any other comments. Okay. Wonderful. So I'm going to move on and please just keep um, adding your comments. These are fantastic. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, using peer review. And I want to say that peer review, anytime you use peer review for the first time with your students, make sure you start by providing a rationale and explain the process. So for example, that slide that I showed you where I had the reasons we use peer review, you know, it shows that writing is collaborative. 
It gives students more ideas for their writing, et cetera. I actually, the first time I did peer review, did a short presentation for my students in which I gave them the rationale for why to do peer review, what, you know, how it can help them. Because often students think, why are my peers grading me? I don't care what my peers think about my writing. I only care what you think about my writing. You're the one who'll be grading me. Um, or they might think, is this just a way of the instructor getting out of doing work, right? Even though, of course, the instructor will still read and, and grade the essays or, or give feedback. So you want to make sure that you talk about these different um, ideas and different reasons up front before you start peer review with your students. Um, and then this all is, you know, related to what I just said is that students when they do peer review have to understand too, like they're not taking the role of the instructor, they're not grading their peers, they're not um, even giving like the final formative feedback, they're just providing helpful feedback that will help their peers improve. And then, of course, you need to model depending on the age of your students or the level, you might want to provide them with a template for some words, they, some, some phrases they could give or ways that they could respond. You could even give them a checklist of a bunch of different phrases like, oh, the, you know, the, the, the thesis was very clear or the three examples were very, um, you know, were well explained and this, you know, the intro had a really interesting hook. And then students could always just do a check mark to check off which things those uh, the, what, what papers include, and that's a great way of, you know, really scaffolding the process of peer review. Um, if you have students that are younger or maybe don't know each, uh, each other as well, you might want to tell them things they shouldn't say or how to say things instead of this is wrong or bad grammar ways that they could say comments that are more constructive and more helpful to their peers. Um, this is the this, these are the instructions that I actually gave my students when they did peer reviews. Uh, I use MS Teams when I teach, so I just type these instructions um, into a into a chat. Uh, but first, I put the students in groups of four, and I gave them each a letter A, B, C, D. And then to you know for each of those um, groups, I type these instructions that they're supposed to post their essay in the thread. So they had to have a first draft of their essay and to post it in their thread with their of uh, three other peers. Um, and if they if they didn't have their essay, they still had to peer review their peers essay. So not bringing an essay wasn't a way of getting out of the peer review process, but they, they still had to help their peers. Um, and then I told them, you know, student A would read student B and C's papers, student B would read student C and D's papers. Um, and that and I didn't actually give them a separate peer review form or peer review checklist or anything like that. I just had them use the rubric that students had used to write their papers. So for example, um, I showed you an excerpt earlier of the rubric from the argumentative essay. So they would look at that rubric again, and they would look at their peers essay, and they would just look at each criterion and give helpful feedback. And I and as I explained here, you're not grading your peers or not rating your peers, you're just letting them know what is well done and what is not or what they need to improve upon. And then um, after they looked at their peers essays and the rubric, they just had to paste their comments in that thread and I gave them an example. So for essay B, uh, for criterion one, uh, they could say all oh, well, of the topics not on the list or for, a cri for a criterion five, oh, interesting intro paragraph and thesis, um, etc. Um, so I gave them some, you know, ideas of the things they could type. So as you can see, this isn't a lot. They didn't have to write a lot about their peers' essays. They're just letting their peers know, you did these things well, you should probably work on these things. I couldn't find your sources, or the thesis was just a summary. It wasn't really a stance. Um, and then if the students had time in that class, then they should read over the feedback they'd gotten from their peers and ask their peers, like, if they had any questions about what they'd written. So um, that's how I did it uh, using, you know, teaching online classes. Um, and these were, you know, I'm teaching graduate students and they're all quite high level. Their English is C1, C2 level. So it's a little different if you're teaching students that are lower level or that are younger, you would probably need to really scaffold this um, and maybe, you know, um, do it, um, like demonstrate in class how, how this needs to be done or, 
um, you know, together the whole class can look at the rubric and then look at a sample essay that you provide and they can provide feedback on that sample essay so that the first time they do peer review is not actually a, uh, by reviewing a, an actual peers essay, but they get to practice on a sample essay. Okay, let's see. And uh, just a few comments I wanted to read here. Let's see. Uh, Camilla said she prefers, when we're talking about rubrics, prefers uh, the holistic rubrics. You have a chance to include specifics. Yes, that's true, you do. And especially, I mean, if you have room for feedback on a holistic um, rubric, I think I've seen sometimes where a holistic uh, rubric was used to grade essays and no feedback was given. The student was just told like, oh, five, good work or whatever. So you, of course you have to include specific feedback. Um, and then Jihan said, peer reviewing can allow learners to develop higher order and cognitive skills as they learn how to evaluate and assess each other's works. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's one of the main goals and one of the main reasons for doing it for sure. And then peer review, it sounds like a cooperative learning, encourage individual and group accountability. Absolutely, Mohammed. I think that that is one of, one of the, another great thing about peer review that students are working together. Um, they're not just writing alone. It's not just, you know, I don't just go home and write my paper and then hand it into the teacher and get the grade I get. It's that I get to go, I get to write and then I get to hear, get feedback from my peers and, and assess things and change things and revise. And I think it's, it's really great, um, really builds community too, if it's done well. Um, and Jihan talked about if it's fitting uh, ZPD. Yes, Vygotsky ZPD. And we're talking about um, learners working. If you pair like a learner, who maybe has some challenges with writing with a learner who has higher uh, level of writing skills. Uh, that's what I put my students in groups of four because I didn't want, although, you know, ZPD, you have the learner learning from someone who's more advanced is wonderful. But if we do that too often, sometimes the higher level student can feel frustrated that they never have someone at their level to learn from. Um, so I think if you have groups of four and you make sure there's sort of like mixed ability, you can pretty much guarantee that there might be a couple of students in that group who have really high levels of writing so they can give each other feedback that's really valuable. Um, and then the students that are lower level can help each other, maybe not be so intimidated by a peer's writing. And then the higher level students can really help them to um, improve their writing. Um, this is a peer review feedback form that I found online, um, which I highly recommend you check out this link. They have a lot of really great materials. And they call this the CARES feedback form for peer review. So the students have to remember to congratulate, ask clarifying questions, request more, evaluate its value, and summarize. So this is a really great way of, of making sure that students who peer review someone else's essay, they have to say something positive. Um, they have to ask questions instead of just saying good, bad. Uh, they should request more information. And um, they do evaluate, but they don't have to, you know, they're not providing a grade. And then summarize, just giving this short summary of what the, what the student did well, uh, what they could work on. So this is a really great form if you have students who haven't done peer review before. You'd still, I think, need to model this and show them how to fill one out, for example. But this is a great way of making sure they touch on all of those different aspects of, of how to give peer review. And um, we talked before um, about the fact that I wanted to mention ways that we can engage students, make students more autonomous. And um, as Lucina mentioned, I did a, a webinar on ungrading. Um, and ungrading, if, if you haven't heard of it, is this idea of you know, taking grading out of the learning equation or limiting grading or not grading everything. Um, and I, I, I'm, I think this, this idea is really fantastic. So um, that's one aspect of something you can do when you want to engage students in this process and have them not so obsessed with just a letter grade. Um, so some ideas for how we can make students, um, you know, really participate in this whole process of ru making rubrics, or using rubrics and peer review, is you can have students design a rubric. So this probably would be best if you've had students, for those of you who said you've done rubrics with your students before, um, and students that are higher level, they actually get to the design the rubric and come up with the criteria themselves. Or maybe you, you might give them the criteria sort of categories like, you know, mechanics or content, and then they come up with a few things 
um, in that category or un under that criterion to describe what a good paper looks like. Um, and then also as an instructor that serves to show you, you know, how well your students understand what goes into a good paper, maybe what things they need to be reminded of. Um, you could do something like, I'll show you an example in a minute of using some open-ended categories on a rubric um, so that students have some flexibility in how they determine um, one of the criterion. You could have students grade themselves with the rubric. This is something that I'm doing uh, this semester. I wanted to try some ungrading. So my students get five grades in their class. One of the grades um, is um, they use a rubric and they get to grade themselves. So one of the five grades, they actually get to evaluate what they've written. Um, they fill out the rubric and they score themselves um, so that there's some, you know, students are writing for themselves, students are writing to, you know, to improve something, students are writing and they're not so worried about the grade, they're actually worried about, they're actually focused more on improving their writing, practicing their writing. Uh, another thing you could do is, like I mentioned before, like, don't give a grade, um, just give written feedback to be sure that students read it. Or another idea I read, which I think is fantastic, and if you have time to do this, which some of you mentioned that you have really large class sizes, so it might not be possible, um, but what you could do is give students their, their papers back with the rubric, and you have all this written feedback, but you have not scored them. So you gave them the written feedback, they need to read over the rubric again, read your written feedback, and then you hold a conference with them. So maybe this is during class time, if you know, if one, I guess you could do this online too, but either way, in person, online, you meet individually with, with each student during the class um, while other students are working on something else. And you have the student, you talk to the student about their paper and the feedback, and you ask the student, okay, after reading the feedback, um, tell me what, what do you think your final score should be? And so in that way, you make sure students are actually reading your, the feedback that we spent so much time writing. And, the, and you can see if they have an idea of what they need to work on or why they um, deserve or don't deserve a certain score, a certain grade. Um, and then I mentioned that you can also do ungrading where the students grade themselves. You could do the same thing, provide the feedback and then the students choose the grade and that, that's the grade they get. Um, if you do peer review, you could actually have the students come up with the questions they want answered. Instead of you know, doing the, the traditional peer review with using a rubric, you could have students say, oh, I really want feedback on my grammar or I really want feedback on the content or the, the cohesion of my essay, uh, or I have a problem writing thesis statements. So I really wanna know, is my, do I have a, a strong thesis? Uh, another thing that you could do is um, when you do the peer review, instead of just having students come to class and exchange their essays and give peer review, you could also give them time in class to then take that feedback, revise their essays with their peers help. So you can really make writing a collaborative process. The students are sitting there together, they get to ask each other questions about their comments, their feedback, and then they get to finish their essays in class. And that also really helps students that are struggling as writers or developing writers um, with, their, with their performance. Uh, and another thing too is this idea that, you know, if we give a writing assignment, it, it should be because we think our students need to learn how to write a certain kind of essay or they need to master a certain genre of writing. So if we give students a writing assignment and then they fail that paper, like they can't write an argumentative essay or they couldn't write, um, you know, um, they couldn't do a sort of uh, a, a lit, they couldn't write a lit review, then what does it mean if we just give them a failing grade? That means they don't know how to do that. Well, what's gonna happen in their next class? So I really think we should think about options to give students to revise what they've done. Uh, when I was in grad school, I really appreciated one professor who said that if we got below a certain grade on an essay or in a writing assignment, we, would, we could revise it um, and then um, to get a, in hopes of getting a higher grade. Like if we'd revised it according to her, comments, et cetera, that we could get a higher score in that essay. Because for her, what was important is that we actually knew how to do that piece of writing. Um, so that's something to consider too. Unfortunately, that doesn't work, of course, if, you, if the essay is due at the end of the semester, because you obviously would need to have time to let the students revise it. So that's probably why it's ideal to not make those essays due at the very end. 
Um, and along those lines, this is something that I talk to students about because I teach a lot of uh, future teachers is that, you know, we shouldn't view grading essays as like a gotcha, or we shouldn't be using the rubrics as a way of, you know, um, making students um, feel bad about their writing. We should look at this as a scaffolding, um, you know, example, a way of showing students how they can become better and better and not as a way of just saying, oh, you failed at this certain genre. So um, when we talk about rubric adaptations, I mentioned before that I have, um, I let my students have some flexibility within their rubric. So for this semester, for my students who are doing essays, um, in order to give a little more openness in, in their essays, and also I find sometimes a rubric can, if your rubric is too defined and too clear and too specific, you don't leave a lot of room for creativity because students might do something you hadn't even imagined. Um, but if there are a lot of criteria for them to fulfill on a rubric, they might not have the time or the energy to actually expand and, and use some creativity. So um, for uh, an essay rubric this semester, for number nine, I said to the students, um, they could define creativity and critical thinking as they like. So I wanted to make sure that their essay was creative or did show critical thinking, but you know, a student might have done something cr creative in an essay that I didn't notice. Like maybe they've used a different kind of source than the kind they usually use, or maybe they don't usually use a hook, or maybe they, um, in their concluding paragraph, they were really trying out some new rhetorical move. Like, I'd like to know that. So this gives a student a chance to tell you, oh, I did this thing for the first time in this essay. Um, so they got to define that, and then they were grading themselves on this essay. And then for number 10, because I really wanted the students to be focusing on you know, their own autonomy, their own individual goals for learning, um, I gave them, you know, there's two points that they could assign to themselves that had to do with either practicing, improving, or experimenting on something. Like maybe they wanted to just really uh, work on using more advanced grammar or using, um, you know, really expanding their vocabulary. Maybe they wanted to write a paper that was you know, less, less formal, it was a little more creative, like more like a creative essay. Maybe they wanted to explore a new topic that they knew nothing about. And so maybe the essay isn't going to sound quite as academic or professional as it would if they were writing about a topic that they know a lot about. So this is, gives them a chance to explain to me what their personal goal was in the paper and gives them a little chance to explore with um, trying, you know, trying some risk. Because learning should, should also be about you know, exploring and, 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 and trying things and um, learning new things and not just having our students repeat the things that they're already good at. Okay, so um, we have, I think we're good for time. I wanna go over um, some of the feedback I got from my students on the rubrics and the um, peer review, and then we'll have time for some questions when I share some more resources. So um, I, last semester I gave students um, some I, I had students using rubrics for the first time with me, at least because it's the first time I was teaching these students. And um, this is some of the feedback I got. I'll, there were the only negative feedback I got on the rubrics from the students was that yeah, at first, getting used to a rubric can be difficult. And I had a lot of criteria on the rubrics, so it was a lot for the students to process. Um, I think ideally you shouldn't have more than 10 criteria on a rubric. I think I had like 20 points and it was, it was a little too much. Um, can I ask everyone to mute their microphones, please? If you have your microphone on, please mute yourself. Okay, so I'm hearing someone talking, just mute yourself. Okay, so these are some comments that I got from my students. Um, like I said, almost everything was really positive. I, so I didn't copy all the comments. This is, these are basically comments that are pretty common. Um, they said that they're really helpful because they knew what they needed to pay attention to. It helped them to get a better grade. They knew what the instructor expected. It was easier to complete the assignment. It helped them be well prepared. Um, they really relied on the rubrics. So when they were, you know, that helps with the, um, the process as they're writing the essay, as they're doing their presentations, they were looking back at the rubric. Um, someone said the idea was fantastic and they wish all of their classes used rubrics. 
Um, and the rubrics helped understand what the instructor pays attention to because each lecture assesses differently. And because I was a new instructor at this university, and also because you know I'm from the States and I knew there would be some cultural differences in terms of um, you know classroom expectations, that's one of the reasons I really wanted to use rubrics because certain expectations I have for an academic essay might be different from what the students think an academic essay is. And so, so that students didn't have to try to read my mind and I wasn't trying to read their minds by having the rubric, they could see what was important to me for that assignment. Um, and then thanks to the rubrics, I was aware of the basis I would be graded on and I think that was fair. So those, those last two were really important to me because it is really true that every instructor is different. And also we want to make grading, if we use grades, we want to make it as fair as possible. Um, and then the student feedback on peer reviews, students really liked the peer review and the, uh, the only negative feedback I got for peer review was that, um, it wasn't so negative, but it, someone said it was kind of hard to give honest feedback uh, because you don't, you know, you don't wanna hurt anyone's feelings. And then someone else said that they wish they'd gotten more detailed feedback from their peers. But overall, all the comments were really great. And um, some said they could, you know, you had a chance to fix their essays before submitting it to me for a grade. They thought that someone else could see what they had missed. Um, and they felt that their peers had corrected them in a respectful manner and that that encouraged them. Um, and also just seeing the way that other people write and other ways of thinking helped them, it gave them ideas. Um, someone said they wanna use it with their students in the future, because I teach future teachers. And then someone said they just really liked getting feedback from someone that wasn't just a teacher or professor. And um, the last uh, bit of feedback I got was sort of that community building. People got to share knowledge and experience and improve their life skills in terms of like connecting with others, how to compliment someone, how to give you know constructive criticism, et cetera. So my students asked me to continue um, doing that in the future. So um, I got really great feedback on rubrics and peer review. So if you haven't used them, I highly recommend that you try them out. So I wanted to give you a chance to uh, make any suggestions, advice, questions about this, and I will check the chat box and see so that I can respond to you. And then I have a few more resources to share that I'll share as you're typing, but please type in your questions or comments or any advice that you have about peer review or rubrics. Um, and Jihan said, it's interesting at defining teachers' expectations and holding learners more responsible. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is because, um, yes, you can say to students, but you had the rubric, so you knew, you knew what you needed to do. But also just, you know, when you're teaching, instead of having to, instead of having many, many students come to you with the same questions, you have that all together in the rubric. And then it's very much an iterative process because every time you use that rubric, you'll think about how it worked last time, you reflect on it and you can change it. You realize you need to add something or one category perhaps wasn't necessary. So I find it to be really interesting. In fact, as I was putting this um, webinar together, I was thinking, wow, there's so much more I wanna learn about rubrics and peer review activities because it can be really powerful to use these tools in the classroom. Okay, so uh, again, if you wanna type comments or questions, please do so. Let me share a few more things with you and then I'll get back to the chat box to check on that. I know in every webinar I do, I always recommend this website, but if you don't know cultofpedagogy.com, you have to go there. I swear I don't get paid by this organization to promote them, but um, Jennifer Gonzalez, who is the creator of that site, is just so great at giving resources for teachers in all different ages, all different contexts, and um, she scaffolds the information so well. So she has an article on the single point rubric. If you haven't used the single point rubric, she has different templates, variations, um, and she talks a lot about how you can use those. And she also always includes lots of links and resources in her articles. Also, um, the ultimate guide to rubrics on, from the gradenetwork.com is fantastic. They have tons of information about different types of rubrics, how to you know, create and revise rubrics, and also lots of other sources and resources um, to do or to use if you're thinking of um, using rubrics for the first time or you want to maybe um, try different types of rubrics. Um, 
and I'll come back to that. Also, if you're not familiar with the AmericanEnglish.state.gov site, they have free materials for English teachers, and they have some articles about peer review and peer assessment if you're interested. And US Embassy Warsaw's um, social media has a lot of great, um, they, they post things about upcoming events that can interest teachers. And the Rila Belgrade Facebook page has web free webinars for language teachers, and it's a really great resource. Um, here are some of the sources I used and some more resources that you can check out. And if you email me at wbarnowski2015 at gmail.com, I can send you the PDF of this um, PowerPoint or of the, I, I can send you this PDF actually, and then you can just click on the links. And uh, I just wanted to say too, um, in the future, if you're interested in doing an exchange program, my um, teaching fellowship is through the State Department's exchange programs. They have programs for non-US citizens and US citizens. And hopefully at some point in the future, those will be, uh, we'll be able to do those again uh, post pandemic. So let me check if there are any questions or comments. Okay, let's see. And with the exception of final exams, I include rewriting as an option for students who want to improve their first text productions. Do you consider writing as a process very important? Absolutely. That's how we teach students that it's a process by letting them, giving them multiple chances to, to write. That's great, Camila. Um, and rubrics invaluable for teachers, Mohammed said, as it helps draw their attention to several writing performance indicators. Absolutely, we get to teach students what we view as important components of academic writing. Um, let's see. And yeah, so wonderful. Um, thank you all for attending today's webinar. I hope you got some great ideas for rubrics and peer review. And I hope that all of you are staying safe and healthy and um, are enjoying teaching this year and um, hope to see you again in another webinar. Thank you, Willow. I would like to thank you once again on behalf of myself and all participants, I'm sure of it, and IATEFL Poland. And we will meet again for your next webinar. I have already pasted the topic and the day for the participants in the chat box. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. See you. <laughs> Bye.